I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Jen Chambers. I am the Assistant Vice President of Lifelong Learning. I also graduated from uh, the Duke Graduate School this weekend and have an undergraduate degree as well in theater um, from 01. So welcome to everybody um, this afternoon for the Forever Learning Institute session in the America's Today theme. Um, today we have uh, Professor Chris Bale who is going to be giving us a lecture on some of his current research Chris is a professor of sociology and public policy at Duke. He's also the director of the Polarization Lab on campus. Um, as a Guggenheim and Carnegie Fellow, he studies the political extremism on social media using tools um, from the emerging field of computational social science. So uh, he recently published a book called Breaking the Social Media Prism, which you all should have received an email about yesterday. I will also post the information about the book if you would like to purchase that, um, the publisher has been very kind and offered us a 30% discount to all the people registered for today's session. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris um, and the lecture for today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jen. And, and thank you everybody for, for joining me today. Um, you know, as, as Jen mentioned, I wish you could all be here to see the, the lovely weather down here. And uh, you know, I hope soon enough, we'll be able to do these events in, in person again. Um, as Jen mentioned, it's my pleasure to speak to you today about uh, a topic that I think is on a lot of our minds right now, political polarization and social media. If you've been following the news this morning, you'll know that Facebook just announced a uh, kind of landmark decision about continuing the ban of former President Trump on the platform. And um, you know, I'd be happy to engage on that issue maybe in the Q&A, but today I want to try to step back and give you a kind of broader picture uh, based on research that we've been doing in Duke's Polarization Lab for the last three or four years. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And I've been trying to up my game in virtual talks lately um, to, to, uh, to allow you to interact with some of the tools and data that I'll be talking about. And so if you check out this link, which should be shared in the chat, um, you'll be able to interact with these slides. Uh, by using tools that I'll present, but also linked to studies and, and other types of resources that you might wanna follow up with after the talk or during the talk. Um, if you want to advance the slides, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see I'm about to click here, which magically makes the next slide come along. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, quite obviously uh, the, the United States is a pretty polarized place. Um, in a recent article in the journal Science, um, about 17 other social scientists and I um, charted trends in American public opinion and discovered that for the first time, uh, hatred of the other party has come to displace admiration for one's own party. And for those of us in the social sciences, this sets off alarm bells. We know what can happen when this kind of intractable um, conflict can, happens when you know, we care more about taking down the other side than, than really solving shared problems. And, and even though actually our attitudes about social policies haven't changed much, we're not much more polarized than we were 20 years ago in terms of what we think about divisive issues such as abortion or gun control. But um, this affective polarization, our tendency to have negative attitudes about each other is really reaching historic and unprecedented levels. So of course, lots of people are interested in what role social media is playing in this process. And um, you know, we've all heard this concept of uh, social media echo chambers. I think these are, um, here we're looking at a Twitter network. And if you mouse over these different circles, you'll see these are different Twitter users. And of course, those that lean to the right are colored in red and those that lean to the left are colored in blue. And what we see, no matter whether we look at politicians or journalists or activists or media organizations is the same kind of clustering. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble in my app here. Um, that is to say that the red seems to hang out with red, the blue seems to hang out with the blue. And the concern, of course, is that this creates a kind of ideological segregation that's bad for all of us. None of us can see that there's two sides to every story, or maybe we have a harder time trying to empathize with the other side or really even listening to the other side. Okay. So in 2017, I founded the Duke Polarization Lab thanks to the Provost Collaboratory Program. So the idea of this program is to enable high quality research that is of pressing public concern. So we have a dual mission. We wanna publish high quality research, but we're also trying to produce tools that the public can use 
um, to actually move the needle on an issue like polarization. Um, and so with the political science professor, Sunshine Hilligus and the stats professor, Alex Wolfowski, we lead a team of about 26 people who write code, <clears throat> conduct experiments and, and do a lot of different innovative research in this space um, that, that we're really excited about and I'm excited about to tell you, uh, to tell you about today. So the very first study we did, this was in 2017, wanted to kind of look at this idea of the echo chamber a little bit more. And you know, at that time, a lot of people like Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg or Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey were saying, you know, well, maybe we should break people out of these echo chambers. We should break up the way that people tend to expose themselves to like-minded people. And so this cartoon is like a silly account of what might happen if we were to do that. So, you know, we, we'd be able, maybe the kind of, I think the idea goes, uh, to, to take off our party identities and to be able to connect with each other as human beings, right? Um, and this, by the way, is supported by decades of social science research, social psychology. You know, it does seem to be the case that when you put members of rival groups into contact with each other under certain conditions, um, they tend to, to become less prejudiced towards each other. So we set out to study this doing a first of its kind study. Um, we wanted to do a study with Twitter bots. I think most of the time when we think about Twitter bots, we think of it in a negative way. You know, We think of bots that spread misinformation or bots that are trying to divide us. But we realized that bots could also be repurposed for social science research and allow us to create an experiment in the real world. So what we did was we recruited about 1200 Republicans and Democrats who use Twitter we asked all of them to take a survey about their political views about things like climate change, racial discrimination, what they thought of the other party. And then a week later, we sent them a message that seemed to be coming from a different group of researchers that told them they could make up to $24 for following a bot or automated Twitter account that would retweet one message every hour for one month. They didn't know what the bot would retweet, um, but they were told that they could earn more money for paying close attention to the bot's tweets. Um, we, we measured whether they were paying attention by giving them weekly surveys that asked about the content of the tweets. And then we re-administered the original survey one month later, which allowed us to kind of start to answer the question, what happens when you help someone step outside their echo chamber? Of course, one big problem is how, how do you know people don't just stop paying attention? Maybe they leave Twitter for a month once they discovered that you were gradually, as we did, turning up the volume of, of people that they don't like of, of the other party. Um, so Republicans were following Democrats, um, not just politicians, but also journalists, uh, public figures, media officials, about 4,000 people that we identified as prominent political figures using some, some tools from social network analysis. Um, but we wanted to make sure that people were actually seeing the tweets we were trying to show them. And so each day, the bot retweeted one of these truly adorable creatures, and at the end of each week, we deleted those tweets and then asked people whether they could identify the images that had been retweeted by the bot. And so if they could, we considered them compliant with the treatment. And if they couldn't, we said they weren't compliant and probably weren't paying much attention. So what I'm gonna show you next is the effect of following these bots for both Republicans and Democrats for one month. So this is how much their attitudes change. Did they become more moderate? Did liberals become a little bit more conservative and conservatives become a little bit more liberal? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, Republicans, uh, especially those who paid really close attention to our bots and were able to answer lots of questions, became substantially more conservative. Democrats, on the other hand, became more liberal, uh, but it was a smaller effect and it wasn't statistically significant. If you want to geek out on the study, you can read it here. It's open access. You should be able to, to read it no matter where you are. Okay, so... Uh, the headline, Duke Polarization Lab Increases Polarization, is not one we were very proud of. So we've spent the last three years trying to figure out why this happened. And the way that we did this was to try to, you know, use every tool available from uh, data science, tools like machine learning, um, automated text analysis, fancy forms of language modeling, to try to see if we could figure out were there differences across subgroups, were there different types of language that different types of people are reacting to in different types of ways? And despite having, you know, the, the full, you know, resources of a, of a high, high quality data science outfit, we simply couldn't answer the question. 
Um, we didn't know why people were double, doubling down in their pre-existing views. And we realized that if we really wanted to answer the question, we might actually have to talk to people and, and see what they were going through when they interacted with these bots or when they were watching these bots that exposed them to a broad range of messages from the opposing political party. And so what we did, and what I write about in this new book, is um, we basically recruited a much smaller group of people to reconduct the experiment one year later. So about 40 Republicans and 40 Democrats once again followed the bot and 40 did not. And then we interviewed them before and after that event. We um, followed them on social media using tools of data science. And then we also administered a survey to them so that we could really try to see them in three different ways, um, you know, online, offline, and then, and then some other kind of, um, you know, things they might say that they might not share with a researcher through a confidential survey. Okay, so what did we find? Well, to, you know, as is always the case with this type of in-depth qualitative research, um, you know, we have to communicate the findings through, through a case study. And so I'm gonna share with you the story of one woman who followed our bot, um, but her story really is, is exemplifies the trends that we saw in the data, especially when we compared people who did and did not follow the tweets. So this story is about a woman that I'll call Patty. She's a 63 year old woman from upstate New York. And, you know, when we first met her, um, you know, she, she described a lot of problems she has in her life. Um, you know, she has a pre existing health condition that had prevented her from getting health insurance and, and left her with a lot of debt. Um, her husband was underemployed in the farming industry. They're really struggling to, to, to make it. Um, when we asked her, you know, are, you know, so what do you think, you know, what's your earliest memory of politics, which is a question we asked to everybody once we kind of established a rapport, she said, well, you know, I, I really don't like either party, but I guess, you know, gun to my head, I choose the Democrats, right? So, um, you know, we wanted to know, um, okay, well, um, you know, what type of Democrat are you? You know, so we asked her some more questions and we discovered that she actually had a lot of conservative views. So for example, she believed that the US was accepting too many immigrants. She, she believed that immigrants were uh, threatening US culture. Um, she was concerned about government overregulation of the economy. In other words, she seemed like exactly the type of person who this, you know, narrative about, you know, Trump's success in the US um, it, it personifies, you know, the type of person who was disaffected by the Democratic Party that had some populist, you know, leanings and that, for, you know, the, the type of person for whom Trump's um, populism might might really appeal. So as we began to increase the number of Republicans in her news feed, I was really, uh, you know, eager to see what happened. Would she buck the trend? Would she, you know, be the, the first one to moderate? Instead, what we discovered is Patty did what everybody else did. Over the course of the month, she moved from being, you know, relatively apolitical to by the end of the month, arguing with, with Republicans about politics. Uh, and she was suddenly able to articulate liberal talking points about, uh, you know, the border wall or the earned income tax credit. And she had, she had, she had kind of launched into this, you know, partisan warfare that we've all experienced online, I think. And, you know, much as we might want to think that someone, when they step outside their echo chamber, calmly and rationally considers the messages of the other side, we really have to think about what is prominent and prevalent and what is most, um, what catches our eye most on social media. And that, the story of many, uh, of Patty and many other people like her suggests, is it's the most extreme voices. So we might want to think that social media can create a competition of ideas where we all have this like wonderfully open discourse and solve all the problems of our day. But really stepping outside your echo chamber is more like stepping into a war that you didn't know what was going on if you're someone like Patty and you feel, you feel forced to, to, uh, to choose sides. Um, in other words, we didn't turn up the, you know, the volume of countervailing information. We, we increased her sense of political identity. And so once we had discovered that identity was so central to the experience of people stepping outside their echo chamber, it allowed us to ask much bigger questions about social media and how it shapes our identities, especially why is everybody so extreme on social media? And you know, are there any moderates? And what are we even doing when we argue about politics on social media? Because is anybody really changing their minds? And we came to think of this through the lens of what social psychologists often call social learning. So, you know, long before social media, and one of the things that makes us distinctly human 
is that we care so much about our identities. You know, each day, whether we know it or not, we tend to present different versions of ourselves. You know, I can be a college professor one day, a basketball fan the, the next day, you know, a mountain biker the next day or whatever. And we look for cues in our, in our environment, our social environment, about what other people like. And we tend to cultivate those identities, again, consciously or subconsciously, that make us feel good about ourselves, that give us a sense of status. So I think if we think about social media in, through this paradigm of social learning, we realize that social media has profoundly changed a few things. You know, one, as the pandemic has so obviously shown, we're so much more isolated from each other. And we're relying increasingly on technology to understand each other and ourselves, especially young people. So, you know, the latest data points are suggesting, you know, as many as 75% of young people spend nearly all their time on online, um, people aged 14 to 17. Now, that's a disturbing statistic for a number of reasons, but particularly disturbing if you're, if you're concerned about how social media um, can distort this process through which we understand ourselves and each other. So what we learned in the book is that um, basically some people care a lot about status on social media um, and those people tend to be social outcasts for whom social media creates a kind of micro celebrity and incentivizes them to say really extreme things. On the other hand, most people are moderates, moderates who derive their sense of status from places other than social media, places like their work or their family or you know, friends or, or whatever. And for those people, you know, posting on social media is really a bit of a liability, right? It can compromise friendships. It can make Thanksgiving dinner uncomfortable, right? It can cause all sorts of problems. And so in, in the book, I profile both these status-seeking outcasts as well as the moderates who disengage. And the central argument and the central finding is that if we take the, the long view, we see that political tweeters, people who tweet about politics a lot, make up just 6% of Twitter users, but they generate 20% of all tweets and 73% of tweets mentioning national politics. And here's the thing, these people are not run of the mill moderates. They tend to be the most extreme. They tend to have views that are either extremely liberal or extremely conservative. Even though if we looked at the rest of the population, we'd see that people with those views only constitute about 6% of the population. So the problem is that, you know, there's an increasingly large gap between social media and reality. And, you know, this has huge consequences for everyone. So let me tell you some, case, some stories from the rest of the case studies in the book. The first is the story of a guy who I'll call Ray. And Ray is an interesting character. He's a moderate conservative man. Um, and, you know, he, but, but he's extraordinarily polite when we talk to him. Um, goes out of his way to, you know, criticize uncivil people online. He says, oh, you know, those are probably all people who live with their parents, you know, like middle-aged people who live with their parents or something like that. And then, um, you know, he even, he's, he's going out of his way to criticize racism and all these other things. And so when we went to look at Ray online, uh, which we did with, with his permission, what we discovered is that he is one of the most prolific political trolls on Twitter. Um, and I say that as someone who's researched this stuff for more than a decade. I mean, unspeakable and horrific photoshopped images, uh, racist memes attacking former President Obama, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a lot of different liberal um, opinion leaders. Um, each night he was kind of undergoing, we discovered, a Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde style transformation. So the question I immediately asked is, why would anybody do this? You know, why would anybody stay up late, you know, photoshopping stuff? Um, and the answer is that the likes and new follows or, or connections that people like Ray make on social media are extraordinarily valuable to them because they tend to be social outcasts in their everyday lives. So Ray, for example, believe it or not, is a middle-aged man who lives with his mother, exactly who was he, he was criticizing in our original interview. Um, he also lived in a very liberal city, which made him feel like a kind of persecuted minority and also worked in a very liberal pr profession. So social media was each night kind of providing a refuge for him and giving him the sense of status he, he didn't have in offline settings. And by the way, I don't wanna make this sound like a partisan thing. Um, there are many similar examples in the book of liberals um, you know, behaving badly who are minorities in say deep red parts of the country. So, okay. So most of the people on this call are hopefully not political trolls like Ray. You're probably more like most people um, your views put you center left or center right or somewhere in the middle. 
Um, and, you know, for those people, why would they engage in this environment that it has become so toxic? And the answer is, of course, they don't. Uh, so the story that sticks with me from all the research that we did is a story of a young Republican woman who I call Sarah in the book. And Sarah is a very interesting person. Um, she's a moderate conservative, but she's from New York. She's half Puerto Rican and her father was a police officer. She went to an Ivy League school. Uh, she, uh, you know, she reads the New Yorker. In, in many ways, she can communicate with liberals effectively and she's sympathetic to a lot of liberal ideas, especially having gone to this you know, left-leaning Ivy League college. Um, but you'll never hear her talk about politics online and here's why. So when we first met her and, and everyone else that we interviewed, you know, we asked them a question like, tell us about the last time you were on social media or, or tell us something important that happened to you recently on social media. And she said, well, about a month ago, you know, I had gotten my kids to sleep. I was up late, I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw a message from the National Rifle Association promoting Americans' rights to own guns. And she said, you know, she posted or replied that, you know, hey, my husband is a responsible gun, responsible gun owner. You know, I support this post, something like that. And she says within minutes, her phone lit up with notifications of people that had visited her Twitter profile, discovered she had children and posted things like, we hope your kids find your gun and shoot you. And unfortunately, this type of story was all too common in our data. In fact, the Pew Research Center recently announced that the leading cause of online harassment or the leading reason why people are harassed online is for expressing their political views. So the book describes a lot of other people like Sarah who tend to disengage. So here's the problem. We have this minority of people making a lot of extreme messages and then we have this vast majority that seems all but invisible. And this is what I call the social media prism, the you know, all, all too powerful and important gap between what we're seeing online and what we're seeing offline. And why is that important? It's because if you think about it, when you step outside your echo chamber, you're not going to encounter someone like Sarah. You're much more likely to encounter an extremist who benefits from trying to get a rise out of you or take you down, right? So um, the problem here is you know, we have a lot of perverse incentives. And one of the first things I started to think about um, when I wanted to write this book, which is really supposed to be, you know, I, I want it to be read by a public audience. You know, um, I, I've been trying to do a lot of this morning. I was on CNN and in a few hours I'm on BBC. I'm trying to get the message out that what we what we really want to do is um, scrutinize some of the prevailing solutions out there um, because there's not a lot of research to, to support them. So, so for example, I promise you right now, delete Facebook is trending all over social media. Probably it's primarily led by conservatives, my guess, because of the decision about Trump this morning. Um, but my concern is that if reasonable, rational, even moderate people who are disaffected by politics begin deleting their accounts, who is going to con continue to take over? It's only gonna make the social media prism more powerful. It's only gonna make extremism more powerful on our platforms. And even though I, you know, am, and believe it or not, am not the most avid social media user, I have a lot of concerns about social media. I have concerns about my kids using social media, um, but I just don't think we can escape it. If we look towards the younger generations, they're so online um, and, and we're so online. We grew up, you know, they grew up with our phones pointed at them. Um, so I just don't think there's a scenario where we escape social media altogether, especially because of growing geographic isolation between Republicans and Democrats. A recent study out of Harvard suggests that most Democrats and Republicans will never or almost never interact with each other in offline settings. That's a stunning statistic that was made possible by some very high resolution geographic mapping. There's a piece in the Times, I think two days ago, that you can use to look at your zip code and see how much of a, uh, uh, how isolated you are from the other party. Anyhow. Um, so social media is here to stay, for better or worse. So I think we need to ask the question, you know, how do we fix it? And I think, you know, a lot of us would like to say, well, Facebook should fix it. Twitter should fix it. They should stop polarizing us. They should take us out of their echo chambers. Well, you know, would that really work? Our research says, you know, maybe not, or, or it, it, at best it might be ineffective, right? Um, what about these foreign misinformation campaigns? Can't they do a better job of tamping down you know, these, these attempts to divide us. Well, the Polarization Lab ran a large study and tried to figure out, are, are misinformation campaigns really dividing us? What we discovered, which was pretty surprising, is people who interact with Russian bots don't look any different than anyone else in terms of their attitudes. Um, there's some complicated reasons for that that I'm, that I'm happy to describe, but overall, 
fake news and misinformation doesn't seem to be the primary driver. Neither does algorithms and radicalization, a very popular idea from some New York Times reporting, but the latest data suggests that this happens to a small, tiny fraction of people. So the upshot for me is even if Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms enacted sweeping reforms for all this stuff, we'd still be left with a supply side problem. So I think what we need to do is think more about how basic human behavior interacts with social media and think about bottom up solutions. I think what we need to do is to help people learn how to see the social media, what I call the social media prism, the way that social media distorts, uh, you know, distorts us and distorts our politics, especially. And so in the book, I offer a lot of, you know, kind of strategies for becoming a more reflective social media user, for learning to see how these distortions happen, for being aware of some of how our own behavior can bubble up to generate these patterns, especially our lack of engagement on social media, especially if you're a moderate. But also know that this type of advice can be hard to enact. You know, we can, you know, it's great to say we should all have more self-awareness, right? But, but really we need to make it a habit. And so here's where I think technology can be really interesting. And here's where we, in the polarization lab, we're trying to innovate and create what we, what we like to call middleware. These are plugins that you can use um, on your own social media feed or in, in tandem with your social media feed to help you learn to see the social media prism, to help you, you know, avoid extremists and boost moderation. So the tools on this page, which, which you can interact with through the presentation if you've got it loaded, um, allow you to um, learn how to identify trolls, political trolls who are trying to antagonize you by looking at patterns in their language or characteristics of their accounts. It can also, if you're a Twitter user, uh, place you on a liberal to conservative scale based upon the content of your tweets. And the, the idea here is to at, encourage you to ask, are you projecting the type of person who you want to be? Um, is, and, and you know, um, this isn't just to tamp down our inner trolls, but also to incentivize people with moderate views that, that we really need you to talk more to bring, bring us back from the brink. Um, we maintain a social media bipartisanship leaderboard. So this is a tool that we built that follows the behavior of large groups of Republicans and Democrats online. And instead of optimizing um, for engagement, we are trying to incentivize people to optimize for engagement across party lines. So the people on this board are people whose tweets tend to resonate with both Republicans and Democrats. And so you can find journalists, uh, politicians, elected officials, lots of other types of people who you can follow if you're on Twitter or if you're on Facebook, you can still follow these people. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the links up yet on, on the app here. Uh, but because we like bots, um, we decided why not also make bots that retweet these messages. Um, essentially, this allows a Twitter user to turn up the volume of moderate content in their feed. So if you're a liberal, you can follow these bipartisan communicators on the right. If you're a Republican, you can do so on the, uh, for the people on the left. Or if you're in the middle or just want to find the middle, you can follow both bots. And, and get a kind of hybrid uh, mix of, of content from the middle. I think a lot of people are really struggling to find the middle and don't know where the middle is. And we're trying to provide tools to help people do that. We've also built tools that help people discover topics that are trending that both Republicans and Democrats are talking about, as well as um, sophisticated language analysis tools that try to determine whether they're talking about them in the same way. So try to find the areas of social media where, it's the, where there's the potential for consensus. Um, you know, it can seem impossible to find political compromise right now, but if we look issue by issue, we see that there's a ton of overlap that we're not exploiting. You know, about 95% of Democrats and about 87% of Republicans support um, universal background checks for handguns. Republicans have far more favorable views of immigrants overall than most Democrats recognize. Democrats have much more favorable views of the police than most Republicans realize. I could go on and on, and I don't wanna overstate this. Certainly there's many issues where we're deeply divided and there's real concerns about um, you know, extreme views on, on, um, that are out there. And I wanna acknowledge that, but the majority of Americans research shows actually want compromise and they wanna find ways. They can't, they can't afford to avoid polarization. And so we wanted to build tools uh, for them and also examine your echo chamber here too. All right, but it's probably pretty naive to think that, you know, these tools will be used forever by large groups of people. Um, as of this morning, we had about 3000 people using these tools yesterday. Um, so, you know, that's a drop in the water. 
right? Uh, it, it's, it's not bad, it, it, you know, it, it suggests they're getting out there. Um, but, you know, if we really wanted to move the needle and, and correct this distortion that social media generates, um, we're just a drop in the pond right now. Unless all of you share these tools um, far and wide uh, with your friends, and I'd be very grateful if, if you would consider doing that. Um, so we, we also need top-down solutions. So I, earlier I was saying, you know, there's no magical button that, that Facebook can switch to tone down polarization, I don't think. Um, but I do think we need to ask a more fundamental question, which is what is the point of social media? We've been too content to allow platforms that were designed for these banal or even sophomoric purposes, like allowing you know, college undergraduates to rate each other's physical attractiveness to serve as the primary forum for you know, deliberation about the problems of our day, right? So it's ridiculous when you think about it. We never stepped back and asked the question, you know, if we could redesign social media from scratch, what should we do? Uh, you know, how could we make uh, social media bring us together instead of pull us apart? You know, all these kind of all these kind of questions are just not being asked. We're just saying, okay, given that we have Facebook, what do we do? And we're spending all of our energy focused on you know bad actors. Um, and the best research suggests that we are either having no impact or very little impact and maybe even a negative impact on our ability to, to root out extremism. So why not invest in solutions, try to find design principles for social media that actually encourage people to act more civilly. And we have a lot of ideas about how to do this. So like, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if I could get into, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's schedule tomorrow, I would say the first thing I would do is change the incentive structure instead of rewarding people for engagement for, you know, producing content that, kind of preaches to the choir and lots of people from their side like, boost people, move their messages up in, their, in the newsfeed for people whose messages resonate across party divides. It's a very simple reform that is very feasible and, and I believe Facebook could actually do. Um, but we also need more research. We just need more access to you know, tools that will allow us to discover what works and what doesn't. And unfortunately, Facebook and other companies are companies that have a responsibility to their users. They have concerns about public relations. They have concerns about the law. And we're simply not going to be able to pull all the levers we might want to as scientists to figure out what uh, a better or more cohesive social media might look like. And that's where we came up with the idea in the polarization lab to create our own social media platform for scientific research. Don't worry, it's not called Discuss It. I realize that's a pretty lame name. Why is it called Discuss It? This is a prototype. We can switch out the name, the logo, how it looks. In fact, we can, we can control any feature of this platform in principle um, to try to isolate which features of social media are polarizing people and which ones aren't, and then pay people to use it in order to try to tease out what works and what doesn't work. So in a study that I write about in the book, we wanted to study anonymity. And you might be surprised to hear that because of that story I told you about the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde character earlier, right? Anonymity so clearly allows us to say things that we would never say in person. On the other hand, anonymity in theory also allows us to focus on the content of each other's ideas instead of the identities of the people who are voicing them. And I think this is a really, interesting idea. It could potentially allow us to explore uncomfortable topics outside the peer pressure that we experience, I think, on a public social media platform. And so in earlier in you know, 2020, we um, early 2020, just before the pandemic, we paid a large group of people uh, to complete a survey about their views. And then we invited half of them to quote, help us test the new social media platform and gave them an invite code that they put into our app that unbeknownst to them paired them with a member of the other party to discuss anonymously either immigration or gun control. And you know, as we um, let this study out into the field, which was really exciting to actually watch, you know, this the science happen, you know, thousands of people interacting with each other, having profound, in many cases, profound conversations about these issues. What we were really excited to discover is that these anonymous conversations um, depolarize people. So people who used our app platform compared to people who did not, who were in the study's control condition, exhibited substantially less polarized attitudes. And here's the really interesting part, the really interesting part for me anyways, the effect for Republicans was about six times the size of that for Democrats, meaning anonymous conversations seem to be particularly important for Republicans to depolarize, suggesting perhaps 
that the, you know, the, the peer effects, the peer influence, you know, the pressure to conform perhaps is really, really strong um, on the right, at least maybe for the issues we studied, immigration and, and gun control. So I would never say that, you know, we want Facebook and Twitter to, to become anonymous tomorrow. I think, you know, we, we, we can't expect any new platform to come along to displace Facebook or Twitter either. Instead, I think this is part of a menu of solutions, of top-down solutions that we can contemplate. One idea I describe in the book is to create a new kind of social media platform, not one that would compete for, for you know, dominance with Facebook or Twitter, but one that would allow um, people to discuss politics in an anonymous fashion where they are rewarded and given status for finding solutions that appeal across party divides. And you could think of that status as kind of carrying over to your website or to your resume. And my prediction is in the next 10 years, people who are able to identify bipartisan um, solutions are gonna be in high demand. Will this compete with Facebook? Of course not. Will everybody wanna use it? Of course not. But for the group of people who want to engage and whose career depends on engaging, I'm hoping that some clever entrepreneur will, will come along and try to take some insights from our search and build out this kind of platform. So I invite you to check out the book. Um, you can find more of our research and more about the polarization lab on this page. And I'd love to hear what you think and, and hear more about um, you know, how you all are experiencing social media, um, you know, whether you have any polarizing interactions with UNC fans or you know, other things of that nature. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. If you have questions that pop in your head now, please feel free to add them. Um, so let me scroll up and get to our first question from Eric. Um, you focus on the audience, but have you done any work on those who deliver the messages, the media, the elite faculty members who seem to be politically joined at the hip? Yeah, I mean, one limitation of that first study that I that I told you about, it was only retweeting elite. So it was only retweeting, uh, not so much professors because we aren't that important, unfortunately, as much, or as much important as we might like to be. But you know, these are more like journalists, you know, elected officials, members of Congress, um, pundits, activists. You know, think of it as people who have tens of thousands of, of Twitter followers. Um, these are the types of people we're retweeting. And you're right. Uh, was it Eric? Eric, you're right that um, you know these are these people are polarizing. We know that people don't like elites, so we haven't done any research on elites versus non-elites. Although you could, in a sense, read our last study, which connected real people to discuss um, issues outside of you know this elite discourse as being showing the potential for for non-elites to to find compromise in this kind of peer-to-peer -peer fashion. But we're also with, with a group of undergraduates this summer, we're building out what we're temporarily calling we need a better name, uh, the polarization pen pal network. And essentially what this is, is you can you can put in your name and we're going to spend the summer trying to figure out ways to pair real people with each other. We have some ideas about connecting people around shared interests, um, you know, shared backgrounds, things like that. And the idea was essentially you'd have a pen pal on social media who's, who's from the other side. Um, in, 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 the, in the idea is exactly to try to create these peer-to-peer -peer connections instead of, you know, exposing people to, to elites who often, you know, benefit uh, from saying polarizing things. Great. Uh, another question we've got in the chat. Um, he said, his area of work is in democratic innovations and deliberation. I'm wondering if your research suggests that another area of possible commonality is the desire for all citizens, conservative and liberal, to be more involved in social political reform and greater political participation between the West. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly support that idea. My concern is that, you know, enthusiasm for politics in the public is, is, is really dropping. Um, you know, I, you know, voter reform is obviously such a such a lightning rod issue. And it's such a shame that it's become a partisan issue because, you know, it's it's a, it's a essential condition of our democracy. Right. So. I don't know how to generate enthusiasm for voter reform, but I can see the seeds of a broader movement about civic education. You know, I mean, we, you know, and I don't, I'm not necessarily suggesting a high school class about, about civics, but, you know, in a social studies class uh, in, in, in middle school or high school, why not start talking about social media and politics, you know, help people understand how social media is distorting our politics, help people understand 
how you know people are behaving to get riled people riled up, but also to encourage civility. You know, I think a lot of young people are growing up not understanding the consequences of incivility. Why? Because they have terrible role models, and 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 all of us adults, right? Or at least the the ones who are getting a lot of attention online. So I, so I think you know I would I would support a broader kind of civic reform. I really recommend checking out Professor Sunshine Hilligus, who's the one of the co-directors of the lab. She has a new book on building young voters. I think that's a great place to start. But you'd, you'd have to ask her for a better answer than I can provide. Great. Um, all right, next question. All of your suggestions involve spending more time on social media. And yet what you demonstrate through your own anecdote, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is the anonymity provided by social media allows us to lean towards our baser instincts. His better behaviors came out when he had to interact directly with fellow humans face to face. Research demonstrates that we have more compassion and empathy for other humans when we see them as part of our own in-group, which is done when we get the chance to observe their humanity and not just focus on their political differences. And that's probably more common than it is a question, but I wonder if you want to- No, that's fine. That. I'm happy to respond. I mean, first to yeah. clarify, I'm not suggesting that people should spend more time online. I'm, sp I'm saying that they should spend the time online differently. Um, so, you know, these are not admonitions to, you know, suddenly spend all day uh, talking about politics, but it's to, to take control as a social media user of what you're being exposed to, you know, you might not like the system. As I said, I don't like the system. I'm not an avid social media user, but we are all in effect voting with our thumbs right now. You know, um, the old expression, vote with your, vote with your pocket, but we're voting with our thumbs now. What we choose to engage or not engage with is hugely consequential. And so again, like, I, I get it. I understand why people might want to disengage from social media, but do you really see a way where we're going to have, I don't know, barbecues and hang out and talk? I mean, is, is that really going to happen anytime soon in this country? Don't get me wrong. I would love for that to happen. I would love for bowling leagues to start again or whatever kind of the romanticized vision of the past that we have, which by the way, I think might be wrong, is, is, is out there. You know, yes, that does work. I 100% agree with you. Study out of, of Penn uh, suggests that a brief 15 minute in-person conversation between Republicans and Democrats can move the needle about 10 percentage points in terms of their attitudes to each other. So that's great, but how on earth do we get people to do that? Um, and I think in the absence of, of more forums, again, because we're growing increasingly geographically isolated from each other, check out this article by Ryan Enos, the Harvard political science professor that documents this. And it's just showing that this type of contact isn't gonna happen. So. You know, if you have ideas about how to fix that problem, I'd I, I love to hear them. But in the, in the meantime, I think we better get started on making social media better. I'm curious, do you think that having everybody, you know, sort of work from home, isolated from one another in the last year, is that going to make things even worse? Uh, just because everybody's been sort of existing in a little bit of a vacuum um, in the last year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as, when I when I said earlier that the pandemic has laid bare, you know, how isolated we are from each other, this is exactly what I was talking about. On the other hand, you know, I was finishing this mm -hmm. book in the first few months of the pandemic and social distancing, and I actually hoped, you know, maybe this is the type of common enemy that can bring America together a little bit. And, you know, it's very difficult to remember this because we're so polarized about public health right now. But in the first few weeks and months, after the pandemic started, there was actually a lot of consensus about the appropriate strategies among Republicans and Democrats, things like social distancing, things like wearing masks. Of course, now those are politicized. And of course, things have gone you know, profoundly wrong if you're, if you're concerned about public health. Um, but there was a moment where it seemed like you know, there was the potential for this common enemy to, to bring us back together. So one of, the, one of the things that I did in the book was to try to revisit the characters, you know, like this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. High guy, the moderate people that I mentioned. So like, well, how are they navigating the, the pandemic online? In the last chapter, I write about this. And unfortunately, this social media prism is stronger than ever, right? The extremists are talking about conspiracy theories about COVID and the moderates are tweeting about sports and video games. And so, you know, it's, it's really only getting worse. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to, you know, speculate about the next year, although I will say that these trends were happening long before COVID. You know, we were using social media in unprecedented numbers, especially again, young people. And I think that's the concerning um, point. And that's where I think that 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 work on young people and, and civic engagement is particularly important right now. Great. Um, okay, so I've got a couple other questions. Um, why is online social media anonymous? If it weren't anonymous, wouldn't angry responses and extremists be self-corrected socially or legally visit vis-a-vis uh, -vis appropriate sequence, uh, uh, consequences, sorry. 
I guess I don't quite understand the question is it is I mean because of course all online interaction isn't anonymous um I, I I take the question to mean like aren't isn't there a lack of cons social consequences for behavior online and yeah I think the answer is yes um and and again that's what's enabling this gap between social media and reality that I'm so concerned about I think the problem is you know when we think about anonymity yes if our incentives are structured so that people get rewarded for saying crazy things like they are right now, then anonymity is a terrible idea because it'll just lead people to say more and more crazy things. If on the other hand, you optimize for tweets or posts that are appealing across party lines, what you're doing essentially is making it much less fun for political trolls to play, right? If they're not able to get their posts up into your newsfeed, if they're not able to antagonize you in, 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 you know, contrary, in a contrary way, if they're being punished for preaching to the choir instead of um, you know reaching across party lines in terms of the, the engagement metrics or the, the boosting, um, you know we'd see a very different thing. I think. Another question: um, Wilkerson suggests that people behave in a manner to preserve their caste status or to rise up in caste, even to the extent of making poor political decisions in the short term, if they feel their caste is preserved or enhanced. Can Twitter bots explore? explore this concept, i.e. polarization equals caste preservation. Can you study something like this? Yeah, I mean, that term caste is, you know, there's a long, long history and, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to, to make those connections directly, I think. Although in a recent paper in Science, some colleagues and I, you know, proposed the term political sectarianism because we do think that this has reached the level where, you know, we care, we're, we're, we're acting in a manner not so different than, for example, you know, uh, Catholics and Protestants in, in Northern Ireland or in many other, you know, intractable uh, conflicts around the world. So I do think, you know, those, those terms are not hyperbole, um, but, you know, I think I would use the term identity instead of caste because, you know, I think what we care about is this kind of us them dynamic. And, and certainly, you know, um, what we'd love to do is find ways to, to break that up. One thing that we've, you know, we've toyed with and we haven't really been able to do a study of this because we haven't been able to raise funding is to see whether there's a curvilinear effect to exposing people to different types of information or identity. So it could be that people like Patty, the woman I talked about, become polarized because they're exposed to some extremists. But what if we had only exposed her to moderates on the other side? You know, maybe we wouldn't, she wouldn't have experienced that attack upon her identity, which kind of mobilized her dormant liberal identity. And maybe she would have become more moderate. So if there's a path, I think it might be moderate bots, which is essentially what Polly is, the, the bot that you can follow on polarizationlab.com. Uh, okay, great. Uh, Temper, just a couple more. Um, this one is from Dr. Connie Bishop. She says, as a nurse faculty member, I teach informatics, including responsible use of social media by nurses. It sounds like I need to be including your research and the use of your tools to my students feel like we've got an emergency met, met, mental health issue with social media. Am I understanding your research accurately? And I'm gonna sort of add to that one is, how is your research sort of, can it be more broadly applied to other industries, to other sort of concepts beyond policy, you know, politics, I think is, is another space that we look at. Yeah, well, first, thank you for the kind words. And, you know, I, I, I would love for them to be useful. I'm a little concerned they would be, you know, imperfect because they really are designed about to, to, to have political discussions. Although I would, I would probably argue, and maybe you'd agree, that um, you know, politics and health have become linked in a in a in a really important way. You know, if we think about polarization as a driver of public health, this is this is clearly a problem, right? Um, not just for this pandemic, but the next one, or or you know, our collective conversation about what we owe each other in terms of health. So, you know, I I, I would be hesitant to say that this is going to solve you know um, problems in any polarized context. I'm even a little hesitant to say it's going to fix problems outside the U.S. And I think we really we need a lot more research on that issue more broadly, um, especially because you know social media is experienced in profoundly different ways in other parts of the world, especially places where there isn't as strong a kind of media infrastructure or civil society. But yeah, I mean. Topic by topic, it would be great. Um, you know, it'd be great to find some some commonalities or some some collective. You know, we know people care about health and safety, right? These are two core concerns that that both parties care about. So, how, how do we get there? Well, it's going to be a long road, and uh, but but a beginning step is probably correcting misperceptions both sides might have about each other. Yeah. Um... Okay, has your research found a more effective way to quash trolls beyond the whack-a-mole reporting method on social media platforms or blocking them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can't do it. You know, I mean, like, let's take the Trump decision, right? 
This decision took 30 of the best and brightest legal minds four months and cost $130 million. Now, I'm, of course, Trump is, is an extraordinarily important case and it's the first case. And so we should, we should expect that it should result in a, in, a, in, a, in a long process. But now the process isn't even over, right? It's gonna go on for another six months before Facebook has to make another decision, right? It is whack-a-mole and, and really, you know, how do you, how do you stop a game of whack-a-mole? You just stop playing, right? You just, you, you don't feed the trolls. It's the old, old, you know, old, old adage, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of technology, again, it's harder, you know, you, I think it cuts to the design principles of social media. You have to make social media platforms less fun for trolls to play on. That's the only way I can think of to, to really move the needle. Um, and, and for the time being, you know, social media platforms aren't doing that. Um, so my, my last question for you is, you know, most of the people on this call are interested in the subject because they want to be more educated. They want to figure out what they can do to help. And I guess that's my question for you is as alums of a, you know, of an institution like Duke, what can we do personally as well as within our communities to help sort of challenge some of these issues that you raised? Yeah, I think the number one thing we can all do is vote, vote with our smartphones, vote with your thumbs, you know, like, I mean, this is, you know, the, the, the downside of our finding is that, you know, at least some significant part of polarization is because of us social media users. That's a pretty tough thing to hear because we, again, we'd love to, you know, go to Facebook and say, fix the problem. Um, but I believe that, you know, the long-term solution is going to be, you know, huge shifts in, in our behavior and, and in tandem again with those top-down solutions. So in the short term, I think, you know, like, at least, you know, helping others realize that there's a gap between social media and reality. If we can create those in-person conversations, like one of the, the commenters suggested, great. Yeah, I would never suggest we shouldn't be trying to do that. Um, but in the interim, you know, get the word out, get the word out about, you know, the good news here is even though we are the problem, we're, we, that means we can be part of the solution. And the other good news here is we're actually less polarized than we think we are. Remember that this social media prism is amplifying the extremists, muting the moderates, making us all feel more polarized. And so, you know, we've, we've done studies, you know, simply correcting misperceptions about the other side, even if you're never meeting someone online or offline or creating scalable effects, not just in the US, but in 26 different countries, according to a recent meta-analysis done by a team of social psychologists. So yeah, you know, like, let's get that word out there. I think that's the best place to start. Fantastic. Um, well, I think the challenge with, with doing things via Zoom is that we can't really applaud at the end of, of some of these sessions. Yeah. So um, if you would like to share any follow-up thoughts or thank um, Professor Bale, please feel to put that into the chat. Um, thank you uh, for participating in, um, in our America Today session um, today. This is fascinating. I saw you speak on this topic earlier this year and um, was so excited to be able to offer it to the alums. So I really- Oh, thanks, Jen. And I want to make sure to, to say thank you to you and to Kim and to Alex and all the other people who made this possible. I'm sure all you alumni would join me in thanking the team that put this together and all these events together. It's such a great time to connect. Um, thank you all. Absolutely. Um, and for those people um, who are interested in learning more, we do have two more sessions left for this month, one with Professor Damon Tweedy and Jean Washington at the end of the month, and another one with Professor Pedro Lash on, um, on art and how art is being used to change minds in different countries around the world. So um, with that, we're going to wrap it up for today. You will get an email tomorrow with links to the Polarization Lab, links that share the presentation that you saw today. Um, and also the link to uh, be able to purchase Chris's book, which did uh, get released earlier this spring. Um, you may have seen Chris on CNN this morning. Um, so anyway, lots of great ways for you to engage with this information and engage with further um, forever learning programs. Um, with that, I'm going to let you guys go for the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you in class in the future. Take care. <laughs>